If there's one physical pattern that defines American cities, it's the street grid. Just as important as the physical pattern though, is how we use our grids and who gets priority in using them. For decades, urban grids across the United States in cities great and small have been equipped to handle large volumes of traffic at high speeds by creating networks of one-way streets. The origins of one-way streets are hard to trace. There's not exactly a museum of traffic patterns and the orientation of a street at a given point in time isn't something that really makes the history books. The earliest recorded one-way street was in 1617 when an alley in London called Pudding Lane was converted to one-way traffic for market carts. There were some other sporadic one-way streets in London and Paris through the 19th century, but almost universally, streets pre-automobile were an uncontrolled mixture of pedestrians and vehicles pulled by animals moving at extremely low speeds. Widespread use of one-way roads wouldn't come until there was both a need for them and a means to actually enforce the flow of traffic. The need would obviously come from the rise of automobiles and then the means to control traffic developed in the 1910s with the invention of electric traffic signals that were widely implemented in cities in the 1920s. By the 1930s, the necessary ingredients had come together for one-way traffic and two cities claimed to have first converted streets to one-way flow in the United States. In 1941, Eugene, Oregon converted 6th and 7th Avenue to one-way flow to accommodate increased traffic. These roads are still both one-way and are the main east-west route through Eugene. The high-speed roads have found a new purpose in the 21st century. Since 2007, they have hosted a bus rapid transit line. Earlier than that, though, is Asbury Park, New Jersey, where, of course, New Jersey is at the forefront of something traffic-related. In 1934, the ocean liner SS Moreau Castle caught fire while sailing to New York from Havana. The burnt-out hull drifted to Asbury Park, where it became a spectacle and attracted such heavy crowds that folklore tells that the shorefront Ocean and Kingsley Avenues were converted to one-way flow for onlookers to cruise and view the wreck, and those roads remain that way until 2007. One-way street conversions in downtown grids usually involve taking a pair of parallel streets and forming what is called a couplet, where each street has one-way traffic in opposite directions. Adjacent to downtowns, one-way conversions were being carried out in a sort of prelude to the destruction of freeways that would soon come. In the late 1940s in Northwest Baltimore, one-way couplets were created going through neighborhoods that Black residents had newly begun owning homes in. The one-way couplets were created without input or notice to the Black communities living in adjacent blocks and were designated as high volume trucking routes or as commuter arterials to improve the connection between downtown jobs and the farther out suburbs that white residents had fled to. In downtown cores, one-way street networks were often laid out with the intent to boost commerce. I'm going to jump into city skylines to visualize this one. If you watch my main series, Failure and Success of Great American Transit, this small city here is in the same vicinity as the city of Washburn that we regularly look at. This city is called Cuyahoga, and it's a small city mostly known as home of the state university, Go Wildcats. It has a pretty strong grid of square blocks and a dense downtown. So our story is going to pick up in the late 1950s. Historically, the population lived around the downtown and got around on foot or by streetcar. They could also travel to other cities like Washburn by train. And in the early days of suburbanization, the downtown shopping district was still the only place to shop. 
not many businesses had relocated to the suburbs yet. Now, on top of the traditional means of arriving at stores on foot or by streetcar, more shoppers were driving in. And with more people driving in, the eternal issues of how to deal with the goddamn traffic and where to park the goddamn car started to present themselves. Traffic on the main city streets was getting congested, and amid declining sales from residents moving farther away, business owners began to get worried that their stores were too hard for suburban shoppers to access. So the Cuyahoga City Department of Transportation gets word that business owners are freaked out and that the city streets are becoming congested and they get to work on some solutions. Level of service. To think like a mid-century Department of Transportation, we need to understand an important concept, level of service. Level of service is a metric for measuring road traffic that's still used today. Most American cities use the definition of level of service developed by the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, AASHTO. AASHTO regularly publishes a road design guidebook called A Policy on Geometric Design of Highways and Streets, commonly called the Green Book because it is green. In the 2001 Green Book, which is the one I could find for free online, level of service is defined as characterizing operating conditions in terms of traffic performance measures related to speed and travel time, freedom to maneuver, traffic interruptions, and comfort and convenience. So basically, how easy is it to drive around places and how fast can you go? The levels of service themselves are grades from A to F. A is the top level of service, which is free flowing traffic at or above the speed limit. Then down at the bottom is F, which is called forced or breakdown flow, basically stop and go traffic. With each level of service, the idea is to pick a target level for the road and then build every element of the road to try and reach that level. So there's a bunch of issues with level of service. The basic premise of level of service measurements is that car congestion is bad and free flowing traffic is the ideal state of a road, which for an intercity highway, fine, free flowing traffic is good. I'll allow it. But is free flowing traffic the ideal state of every urban street? From a pedestrian perspective, high speed free flowing traffic is horrible to exist around in a city. I used to have a job on 3rd Avenue in Manhattan, which is like a five lane wide highway, one way going straight through the city. And I've biked up and down it and it's horrible. It's unsafe. The air quality is awful from all the traffic. So maybe from a motorist perspective, it is nice to have these easy to drive on roads, but is a few minutes of saved time really worth the detriment to the city. In pursuit of free flowing traffic, engineers rely on projections and traffic modeling so that a road meets its level of service at peak traffic. That means that the other 22 hours of the day, the road is over-designed and on over-designed roads, drivers speed more endangering pedestrians. And we'll get to the danger in a minute. That's pretty much the crux of level of service though. It measures and prioritizes only motor vehicles to the detriment of every other road user. Level of service can be applied to pedestrians or cyclists or transit, but it rarely is. And most road designs made utilizing level of service only consider those modes of travel in so much as making sure that they don't impede drivers. Unfortunately, level of service is what dominated road design and planning for most of the 20th century and is still widely used today. Our level of service driven Department of Transportation takes a look at the downtown and decides that traffic needs to flow easier to encourage more consumers to drive to businesses. So the Green Book recommends a D or E level of service for urban arterials and recommends that to reach a D level, cities make use of one-way couplets. There's a problem to deal with first though. The Cuyahoga Transit Company is still running trolley buses in both directions on the street. And so if we convert it to one-way flow, we're going to need to move the buses. Unfortunately, by the 1950s, declining ridership forced the transit company 
into a state of managed decline and the money just isn't there to string up miles of new wire on the next street over. So the Cuyahoga Transit Company did what transit companies all around the country did in the face of demands to alter their streetcar and trolleybus routes to fit one-way traffic. They pulled down the wire, scrapped the fleet, and replaced every single route with diesel buses. One-way streets killed off a handful of late holdout streetcars and trolleybuses this way. Okay, so with the trolleybuses out of the way, we're going to install a handful of couplets connecting the downtown to the new expressways that ring the city. Along the couplets, traffic signals are going to be synchronized to move traffic in waves at higher speeds to keep our street free flowing. Now, with the one-way system in place and traffic solved once and for all, does this help out businesses? Well, as early as the 1950s, downtown retail associations began complaining to city councils that the one-way conversions designed to help drive traffic to them were actually hurting their business. One of the initial complaints was that one-way road networks downtown were confusing to out-of-town shoppers. Anybody who's driven into a city with one-way grids can probably relate to this. You're driving downtown for your anime convention or watch the team play at the Thunderdome or whatever it is we used to do before we all got locked inside and you're a block away when suddenly no left turn allowed and oh geez, okay, no right turn either. All right, okay, just keep going until we find another turn and uh, oh God, where are we? Oh, oh wait, we're, we're by the grocery store or wait, is that the disco grocery store or the murder grocery store? An issue that was identified later on was speed. When driving, there's this concept of friction that regulates our natural speed. Narrow lanes, oncoming traffic, and street parking all create friction that makes drivers slow down. Engineers worked as hard as they could to reduce friction to maintain a high level of service and that gave us one-way roads with no parking and wide traffic lanes. Above 30 miles per hour, drivers are moving too quickly to scan storefronts and signs, so traffic to small storefronts falls off a cliff. Really, the only businesses that benefit from high-speed traffic are big box stores with enormous signs and parking lots, and these same attributes are a turnoff to pedestrians so it's really hard for a business to try and cater to both shoppers arriving on foot and at 40 miles per hour. All right, so some of the smaller, less visible storefronts in Cuyahoga go out of business. And with street parking removed from a lot of the streets, uh, we need some more off-street parking. So a bunch of these are just demolished and replaced with parking lots to serve the remaining larger department stores. So it's not bad. It's not bad. We're just, we're just, we're... You know, it's a necessary change. There's there's somewhere to park the goddamn car now, you know? Speed is also bad for pedestrians. Pedestrians struck by a vehicle moving at 15 miles per hour have only a 10% chance of being severely injured. When the vehicle's moving at 30 miles per hour, that chance jumps to 50%. One-way streets were supposed to improve pedestrian safety. The main arguments were that pedestrians would only have to look in one direction before crossing, and that intersections would have fewer points of conflict where a driver could strike pedestrians. In reality, this didn't pan out. Even if the number of potential conflict points is reduced, the increase in vehicles and speeds makes up the difference. Without having to slow to yield to oncoming traffic, vehicles turning left from one-way streets strike pedestrians more frequently than all other turning vehicles and do so at higher speeds. The final factor that hurts business is this concept called eclipsing. When traffic flows in one direction, all drivers pretty much have the same view, and while driving or stopped at an intersection, buildings facing away from the driver are essentially invisible. This means that the storefront on the near side of the block at an intersection is going to take a major hit to their traffic. So a bunch of corner stores in downtown Cuyahoga are gonna close up and, you know, we'll just replace some more parking. Eclipsing works in other ways too. Moving at higher speeds in one direction, drivers can no longer see into alleys and entryways 
And according to Jane Jacobs' theory of eyes on the street, areas that have less visibility become more susceptible to crime. And again, the results of this land on the shoulders of pedestrians and not drivers who are secluded into their own cars just speeding through. After suburbanization took off, stores didn't stick around in downtowns forever. Even with these attempts to bring traffic to shopping districts, businesses eventually catch up with housing trends and leave the cities to set up new storefronts in suburban shopping strips. Which leaves us with a downtown setup for high-speed traffic, but empty of residents and stores. Most of the users of our high-speed road network are office workers commuting in in the morning and leaving in the evening. Our transformation is complete. The city is no longer somewhere to exist inside of, but somewhere to speed in and out of as quickly as possible. So one-way conversions continued through the 1970s, and just like it was hard to trace the origins, it's hard to find exactly when cities started undoing one-way street networks. One source attributes the origin to urban neighborhoods in the 1980s that white baby boomers had moved back into, trying to get high-speed traffic out of their residential neighborhoods. In the 1990s and 2000s, converting streets back to two-way flow gained popularity for pretty much the same reason one-way streets initially did, economic activity. By this point, cities had figured out that slower two-way streets were good for foot traffic and getting people out of their cars and into businesses. Two-way streets can be good for parking too. A four-lane one-way road can be converted into a two-lane two-way street with angled parking which is a selling point for businesses. I think doing two-way conversions just for economic impact is something to be wary of though. First, it feels kind of cargo culty that when an area is struggling economically, we throw our hands up and just say, change the direction of the traffic again, without a wider examination of what's really going on. Second, there's not even a guarantee that converting back to two-way flow has positive economic impact. A study of conversions in the 2000s found that two-way conversions didn't so much provide more jobs or funnel traffic to businesses, but that they were associated with new housing development and rising incomes. Basically, once the street is no longer a dangerous highway, wealthier residents are willing to move in and existing residents are pushed out. But still, many cities have launched two-way conversion projects with pedestrian safety as a goal too. And even if the motivation is partially economic, I do think that it is good that cities are examining their road networks and how they determine whether or not the roads are successful. Moving away from metrics like level of service is necessary to make changes to roads that prioritize users outside of vehicles. Luckily, some cities have started to move away from level of service. The National Association of City Transportation Officials is a newer organization that also publishes design guidelines for roadways and offers up alternatives to level of service that take into account pedestrians, cyclists, transit, private vehicles, and also less measurable metrics like sustainability. How we design and use our roads shows how we want our cities to be used as well. As we move past the era of viewing American cities as a place to drive through and hopefully into one that recognizes cities as a place to live, we need to reshape our roads to match that. And when we do that reshaping, we should hopefully do it with more consideration for road users outside of vehicles and less for suburban commuters and perceived economic benefits. If you like this video, remember to subscribe and check out the rest of my videos about transit and cities. You can also support my videos on Patreon. Follow me on Twitter at Big Mood Energy and thanks for watching.